Our next talk is from uh, a guy called Yunong Shao, and I don't speak Chinese, so I hope I didn't butcher that name too badly. And he's going to talk about platform as a service as a way to integrate microservices together and deliver them within an organization. Now, platform as a service has a, a bad rap, I suppose, um, but you know, we've been doing it for 10 years, and like most things we've been doing for 10 years, we're starting to get really good at it. So I'm really looking forward to seeing Yunong's talk on paved, uh, the paved paths to microservices. Yunong, where are you? <laughs> Welcome. That was a perfect pronunciation of my name, so that's great. That's good. <laughs> well, hey, I'm Yunong from Netflix. Um, really excited here to talk to you guys about the paved pass or path. Uh -huh. um, anyway, I work on the I work I, I work on the microservices platform at Netflix. Um, so a little bit about us. Does anyone watch Netflix? Anyone? Hands up if you have a sub. Hooray! Wow, that's like ninety five percent penetration. I should just go home. Right, our job is done. Um, anyway, so we have this all this great content you can watch and anywhere, anytime. Um, and we've had some pretty stunning subscriber growth over the last few years. So all the way up to ninety five million, ninety ninety five million subscribers at the last time we had a at our Q4 from last year, so kind of on this really great growth trajectory. And at the same time, we've been making this really uh, concerted push to be everywhere. So everywhere that's red is where we where the service is available. So if we have a pretty international crowd, you know, you'd be happy to know that everything's available. Um, but this talk is really about microservices. So here's a quick sneak behind the curtain of uh, some of the microservices at Netflix. I had to redact all the names of the, all the microservices, obviously. but. Each little circle there is, is a microservice at Netflix. And most of these are actually all in the runtime path. So you can imagine like something comes in, has to talk to all of these different services. Um, so what today we're gonna, what we're gonna cover is really two different concepts, right? Reliability and velocity, and how those really affect the way in which you think about architecting microservices, because both are really important. Um, if you think about reliability, it's really around, you know, as we've scaled up the way that we deliver microservices at Netflix, Every single microservice that's in the runtime path has to be reliable, right? If it's down, you can't watch your, your awesome content, right? Traditionally, when you have the monolith, it's just the monolith you worry about, but with hundreds of microservices, they all have to be available. And the other thing is around velocity, right? As we want to innovate faster, so how do we bring, you know, couple velocity with reliability to deliver these on uh, the microservices architecture? So let's start with reliability. Um, Americans will know what that is, but that's, that's the old faithful geyser in Yellowstone National Park, which goes off every two hours or something like that on the dot. And when we talk about reliability, we, we talk about it in, the, in sort of the sense of, if you have, if we took that big picture of all the microservices we have on Netflix and really break that down a little bit, um, really what we're talking about is you have a service and a client, you know, and our client in this case is the device that's out there or the customer that's using it, using the service. And that calls out to, about, um, to, to the Netflix service, which is composed of many microservices, right? So you have this nice fan out. So I may talk to one microservice, which depends on some other microservices, and so on and so forth. And pretty soon you have this sort of cascading chain of distributed systems. So if we break apart a microservice, um, really it, it's, it, you know, each service is made up of a bunch of different components inside, of, inside the internals of it, right? So anything from being able to do RPC, um, which is both inbound on, on the way in from your, your, um, your clients and outbound to any of your dependent microservices, to stuff like the runtime, which could be like Java or Go or, Node.js or whatever it is, to the framework that helps you easily write these microservices, um, to insights, which really helps you operate them reliably, right? So if you get metrics and logging and all of that, it really helps you. And finally, your business logic, and that's kind of what differentiates, what we like, what we think differentiates each microservices there. We're encapsulating that business logic for each of those different services and teams. So if we were to take a look at um, one of those components, let's say just pick RPC, for example, here, I took a quick Google of the different kinds of RPC that's available out there today. There's a whole ton of them, right? And I'm missing a whole bunch as well. But the point here is that you know there's quite a wide range of different technologies you can use. And one of the things that you hear folks talk about a lot when they talk about advantages of a microservices architecture is that, hey, I, ha I can have diversity in the ecosystem, right? So team A may want to use Python, team A could want to use Java, and someone else might want to use gRPC for their RPC. So if we're just using RPC example here, and we go back to that image, let's say like we have a microservices architecture and we have that full freedom um, of, hey, you can use whatever you want, right? Um, you can use REST, you can use gRPC, Finagle, 
HTTP, whatever it is. Um, that's really great, except for when you have an error with the website, right? Like, or the service. So let's say there's an error. This is something we never want to see, right? How do I go about debugging that now? Like, if you extrap extrapolate that last picture here, this is just RPC, but let's say you now spin that out to like the runtime, the language, the frame, the, um, the API framework, critically like all the metrics and logging. If all of that was different, you're now introducing, you know, orders of magnitude more complexity. So like a microservices architecture is already pretty complex, right? You have, you know, in our case, hundreds of microservices that back your main service. But what happens if all, all these microservices are just completely different in every sense of the word, right? Um, as your SRE or your site ops people, they might just go crazy because, like, how do you how do you actually go about debugging one of these problems um, when you have, you know, oops, when you have you know hundreds of different microservices? You, you can't right really reliably know because no one they might not be emitting the same metrics, they may not be running on the same set of uh, RPCs. So how do you build tooling to make sure that you can visual fully visualize what's going on in the system? And the, the, the question the answer is you really can't. And this is where sort of reliability comes into play, right? Um, Microservices architectures are really great, but they also have to be super reliable. And as you increase the surface area of the number of teams that's running microservices, what's really key is consistency. Does anyone know what this is? Anyone ever work on their own cars? So this is an OBD2 port on every single automobile that's been made in America after 98. So after 1998, every single car has the same port. And what that port is is, is a common interface if you have a problem with your car, you pull into the mechanic, any mechanic, or you can buy one of those little OBD2 readers online, and you plug that in, and it, it, every single car has to emit the same set of diagnostic metrics. So you, some, your check engine light comes in, you plug in this little device, and it shows you exactly what's wrong with your car. It doesn't matter what makeup car you have, right? You could have a Ferrari, you could have a Volkswagen, um, you could have whatever it is, but they all emit the same set of metrics and diagnostics. To, all right. Mm-hmm. Right, but there's a common set of metrics, right? So, right, but there's a common set of metrics, right? So, I mean, the, the key here is that the whole, the whole point here is that you want to have consistency, and this is just an example of how that helps. I mean, imagine if every single car had a different port and emitted a different set of metrics. It would be really hard to diagnose, and your mechanic would have to, you know, figure out all of the different parts. And so, we, we want to do the same thing. We do do the same thing here at Netflix, which is we consolidate all of our components in the same way, right? So that picture we showed of the microservice um, and all of its, its different components, we've kind of consolidated all of these different components. So we just have one or two of them, right? So for example, for RPC, um, we're using REST for legacy services, but for new services, we've decided to go with gRPC. And for our runtimes, you know, we officially support Java and Node. And so on and so forth. And something critical I want to point out here is like insights, right? We have a team that their, that their entire responsibility is to support insights. And something that's really critical here is that um, you know traditionally you have if you're writing a, if you own a microservice, right? You own that entire stack. So you're owning the RPC, the runtime, the framework, all all the way down to the business logic. And what we've done, um, so the way that we sort of try to solve the commonality problem is we have platform teams that own all of these common components, right? So we have a platform team that owns metrics, and they provide all the um, sort of components for the metrics uh, platform. So you don't have to worry about that. Same thing with RPC and the runtime. And the key here is the consolidation, right? Um, a good example of this would be, you know, um, for, for metrics, for example, um, every single service on Netflix, because they're using the same set of RPC frameworks, attaches or reuses a header that's the, that's the Netflix request ID, and this is just a UID that's generated. As soon as, as, because every service, single service respects this, this is available in all of the service logs. Right? So if you have a problem with a specific request, you can now see the span of all of the requests and where it's been throughout the entire system. So if we think about that picture I showed earlier of the hundreds of microsystem, microservices, and customer calls in and says, hey, I have a bad request, and here's the request ID, we can actually trace that throughout the entire system and easily diagnose that. And so this is just an example of where commonality and consistency in your components really help you to run reliable microservices. And so a quick consol uh, recap on this co component consolidation, right? If you consolidate and, and you maintain consistency with, with your microservices, that means you get a lot of reliability, right? Um, and that request ID is a good example of that. But this also goes down to like having the same set of metrics and logs, um, being able to build RPC and stuff like that. But also having, um, this is also important because now your service teams can focus on the what, which is just that business logic. That's the only thing that really truly differentiates different microservices within the same company and the same stack. 
and not how, right? They don't have to focus on re reinventing the wheel um, of, you know, what RPC am I going to use? How am I going to emit metrics? And instead, what we've decided to do is invest in dedicated platform teams for these common components, right? So now we have a metrics team, or an insights team, rather, and a runtime team. And again, this helps to abstract away all of those common components to subject matter experts who, you know, it can innovate and support these components, and you don't have to have farm these out to the various teams that owns them. And this then in turn gives us a reduced support burden as well because now we no longer have to support you know, every single RPC system under the sun. We support the couple that, that's first class um, and teams don't have to worry, worry about like, hey, is the RPC mechanism I'm using reliable? Well, it is because it's, it's maintained by a centralized team. It's used everywhere. And so we, we can also develop a great set of tooling around all of these components. So let's move on to velocity here. Um, so why do we care about velocity, right? Like why, you know, why is it a, such a big deal? Uh, other than your manager saying, you know, when, are you, when is this going to be done? Or the product manager telling, are, are we done yet? Well, the biggest thing for us is, 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 is around innovation, right? The, the quicker and the faster that we can react uh, and make changes to our service, the more likely we can get these great features out to our customers, right? And, you know, one of the things that really distinguishes Netflix and our service, um, which, is, um, uh, you know, which is not just the content, but also the user experience, right? right? So to be able to push downloads out really quickly, to be able to, really do bleeding edge stuff like VR experiences for our customers is really important for us, and that's kind of where we differentiate. So innovation is important, and in order to achieve the kind of innovation that we're looking for, we need to increase the velocity in which we can make changes to the service. And so it's important to talk about sort of the infrastructure as a service revolution before we talk about paths, right? And so, you know, before cloud computing came along and infrastructure as a service came along, everyone had these big, heavy data centers, and they had to manage all the hardware and the infrastructure themselves. And you know, at Netflix, we're kind of one of the poster child for, hey, moving on to the cloud and moving completely onto the cloud. And so we've, we've done that, and we've gotten some really great wins, which is, hey, we're no longer managing the metal, but instead, we now treat infrastructure just as another resource that's readily available, right? So this is kind of our open source um, software. It's called Spinnaker that lets us easily manage infrastructure in a touchless manner. And this has been really great, because now this gives you the ability to like, hey, I need, I need some servers. Boom, here they are, right? You don't have to do anything. They just, they just show up for you. But there's still something missing here in terms of getting better velocity, right? There's a few areas of friction. One which is like, hey, I've got the infrastructure now, but I still, and we talked about, you know, I have all these teams that maintain the centralized platform components. I still have to assemble them together, right, to make a service, right? Because anywhere from the operating system that I'm, I'm using to the, the platform bits that I have to assemble myself, to the load balancer that I hook up, maybe it's caching. There's a whole bunch of different other things that go into making a microservice, and that you just don't get with just the platform component. So I have to do some assembly. The other thing that causes a lot of friction, as you know, if uh, if you have engineers in the audience, is as we know, development and testing, deployment and operations. That's like the other half of the battle, right? Like I've kind of like assembled my service, I have my initial cut, but I have to continue to maintain it. Um, I have to make sure that it, it works all reliably. And that usually requires a lot of custom setup to set, up, set it up and make sure that you stitch that together through all the infrastructure that your, your, um, your, team, your infrastructure teams are providing. So let's take a look at assembly first um, as, as the first area, right? How do we sort of reduce the friction in this area? So remember that like, if I have a service that's running on infrastructure as a service, I have all of these different bits that I have to assemble together, right? Even though they're owned by all these centrally managed teams, I have to still uh, assemble them together. So how do we... But the thing that I really only care about is literally the business logic, right? That's the only thing me as a service owner really that I care about. I don't, I really don't care how it even runs at this point, right? And that's kind of what we're trying to get to is I've got a service, right? All the other parts about that service that, that sort of I need to be able to run the service, I, I don't care. I just really only care about my business logic. So how do we make that happen? This is a good time to introduce platform as a service and a quick recap for folks. Uh, the biggest thing to realize is that it's, it's a category of cloud computing that lets you develop, run, and manage applications without the complexity of building and maintaining infrastructure, right? So we talked about the IaaS revolution, which is like, I don't have to maintain the hardware behind the infrastructure, but now the next step I want to get to is I don't even want to have to think about the infrastructure at all, right? So how do I do that? Because if I don't want to do that, then it helps me to be a lot more quick in terms of um, being able to maintain and develop my applications. And the thing that we've done, and we've, our goal with, with sort of providing the Netflix service platform is to be able to quickly build and deploy services, right? So what's, what, what is in our Netflix service platform? Um, well, it, you know, it starts with a, a standard set of insights, like metrics and, and logging. Again, because reliability is critically important, so let's make sure we you know, build that as part of the platform. 
The second part is actually the integration with the Netflix cloud ecosystem. So we talked about all of those platform components that um, all of our platform teams are maintaining. Well, let's just bundle that into the platform in general. So like, let's, we'll, the, our team now, we will, we'll, this, the platform team rather, will maintain and sort of handle all of the assembly of all of these different components into the platform. So you as the service owner don't actually have to worry about that anymore, right? If you use the platform, you get all of this integration for free, right? So I don't have to do any of the configuration. We'll add testing and assertion frameworks with mocks to make it really easy for you to test and therefore write more reliable systems. And we'll version this, uh, all of the services you write on this platform. And that's really critically important for deployment and, de uh, and development as well. And so now each service now runs inside a pre-assembled platform. So the only thing that you're providing now is just the business logic. Um, you can define one or more routes with a route handler, right, for each of these, um, each of these routes. And again, that's just JavaScript or Java or whatever you want. But Again, you're just writing that business logic now. You're not you know, starting from whole cloth and trying to integrate all of these components together because we've already done that for you as part of the platform. But you have access to all of these platform components within, within your business logic. So if you want to emit actual logging or metrics specifically to your service, you can. You can also bring additional dependencies to give you additional flexibility. So quick recap of the service platform, right? We, 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 our goal here is to drastically reduce the surface area here, right, for an for, um, endpoint or uh, microservices owner. So they don't have to worry about how am I going to assemble everything together, uh, reduce the sort of moving parts that's, that they have to deal with to assemble their microservice. And let's abstract away all the common patterns of, you know, how do I set up a service with all these components? Where do I need to emit the metrics? You know, how do I configure all these different components? And really let these teams focus on what's important to them which is just their business logic. So let's move on to like the, the, the other parts of um, um, deploying and running a microservices architecture, which causes a lot of friction, which is really around development, testing, deployment, and operations, right? Anyone here who runs a microservice run realizes that like that's actually where you spend a lot of your time as well. And so how can we speed that up, right? Make that stuff less, um, uh, much, much easier for our, for, for, for our users. But generally, your, your sort of you know, service development lifecycle looks something like this, right? I've got a service up and running, but I've got some you know, feature requests that I need to bake into my service, do some development, and then I have to deploy it, operate it, and then suddenly that, then that shows up into my service. How do, we make, how do we make this easier? Because generally what this means is you know, when you're doing, say, the development step, you have to go create, um, when you first create a service, you have to create all the associated infrastructure that goes along with that service. And a lot of things that we don't really quite think about as we're first developing a service, that becomes critical when you have to operate it. Things like dashboards, right, alerts, um, all the different deployment pipelines and build pipelines for you to build the artifact out to, um, out to, the, out to the cloud. Um, even things such as like CI and CD infrastructure, right, all of these things, um, if we don't have anything or if there are no established patterns, most of these service owners will have to reinvent themselves, which is, you know, tedious, but but also you know, um, uh, introduces a lot of friction. So how do we solve some of these problems, right? Solution we think here is automation. And what does that really mean, right? Well, what we've done in Netflix is we've created a set of automated development tools, which is really like an SDK um, or a CLI that lets you easily sort of use, basically, I like to call it one click, right? One click basically sets you up um, for success for, for your microservice. So there's, some, there's something that's called Newt, which is the Netflix workflow toolkit, and we hope to open source it at some point. But I'll just walk you through some examples, right? And remember that the whole sort of aim of this toolkit is for consistency and reduced developer friction, right? So the first thing is, how do I install it? Well, that's just one click, right? So I just curl URL and then install it to my box. Um, but it also lets me bootstrap my project, so I can type new setup, and what that does is actually sets up my local development environment, so that brings in all the dependencies that I need to, to start building on the platform as a service uh, model that we, we've just discussed. So that brings in, th brings in things like the, um, the uh, brings in things like Docker, the runtime that you're on, um, sets up all the requisite operating system binaries, um, you know, things that we, we, we kind of take for granted, but like things like how do I set up my Git repository? How do I sort of you know, version all of that stuff? How do I, just all the things that comes around with bootstrapping a project, now that's just one click, right? This stuff actually, you know, how do I set up my, my dashboards and my build pipelines, um, all that stuff that we generally don't think about, but you know, if you, if, you, if you actually had to ask one of your engineers, like how long does it take you to do that for a new project? They probably would tell you like a couple days. I forget how I do that, right? I have to go look at the documentation. So not only are we streamlining this so that you can set this all up in a matter of minutes, um, we're actually also making it consistent because 
if you're using an automated tool, it's going to set it up the same way all the time, every time. And if we need to make global updates to the way that we set up and deploy applications at Netflix, we could just push an update to the tool and that's you know, applied everywhere that it's being used. So what about building and running and debugging your server locally? That's also something that's really important, right, is um, how do we improve developer velocity, velocity and productivity, right? A lot of the times, you know, maybe you have, you're running something locally, you, you have unit tests, but that doesn't really reflect the way that it's running in the cloud, right? Because you have a different environment. You're on your Mac versus you're on some, you know, Linux instance on EC2. So how do we make sure, you know, we try to make that as frictionless as possible? Well, you know, this development, this new develop com uh, command does that. And what that does underneath the hood is, um, you know, all of our new microservices of Netflix are running um, on top of Docker. And so we can actually easily just pull down Docker images that, uh, that's, run, um, that's exactly the same Docker image that's running in production and, you know, pull them down so they're running locally no matter where you are and right? no matter what environment you are. But critically, this also lets you do things like live reload and being able to attach debuggers and snoop the logs and look at all the metrics that's flowing exactly as if you were developing this server um, out in the cloud, you can do it locally, right? So again, this further reduces friction because now it used, it used to be that you have to go build, build and release this build out to the wild and then you know, run that in test and then see how it's doing. Now you can do all that stuff locally. And so writing your code is very easy now too because all you're now, like we talked about earlier, all you're now implementing is just that business logic. So you don't have to worry about, you know, hey, am I setting up my, my, my frameworks correctly? Is there anything wrong with the platform? Because that stuff is all just taken care of for you for, by the platform. And if I'm um, publishing a version image, right? So now I've got some changes that I've made. I want to publish that and sort of send that out to my testers for them to test or run that in my staging environment. Again, these are all just one-click one commands, right? You, these, we have these recipes that's been published, and you just use these commands. And that will publish a version of your app you know, to, to our um, application index, and that's globally available now for folks to use and, and deploy. And deployment is also really, really easy. You know, it used to take us quite a while to do deployment because you have to go through all the different pipelines that you, you have to set up. But now with a one-click command, I can you know, pretty quickly deploy to any stack anywhere um, where we have data centers. So a quick recap on automation. You know, we think it really increases productivity by sort of, again, abstracting away all the common types of sets of stuff that we have to do when it comes to developing a service. Um, so that's huge. I mean, um, the other thing that, that I find really nice about automation is it removes, it removes humans from the loop, right? Anytime you can remove humans, you know, we're prone to error. So let's try to remove as many humans as we can from the loop. There's been countless times where, oh, you know, I forgot to set up the unit testing framework um, in, in Jenkins or wherever it is, and I pushed the prod and, like, I missed a step, right? When I pushed the prod, I forgot to delete the old cluster or I accidentally deleted all the clusters. I'm not just making these up. These are all you know, true stories that happened in the past. So if we remove humans from the loop and have a set of sort of rigorous, well-tested recipes um, with tooling to help you do this with one click, it improves reliability. And the consistency part is really great too, right? That, that kind of folds into to, to sort of re removing humans from the loop. All of our build pipelines, dashboards, alerts, projects, setup, all of that stuff is consistent now. So it makes it really, really, really easy um, to operate this stuff as well. So as a recap today for everything we talked about, you know, we talked about how are we going to provide a pay path to get folks to more easily write reliable and, and um, consistent microservices at a high velocity, right? The first thing is platform consolidation. Consolidate as many uh, components of your common microservices architecture as you can. And what I mean by consolidation is on two, two, path, two fronts, right? Consolidate the technologies and, and various stacks that you're using, but also try to consolidate them into centralized teams who then can maintain and own all of that stack, right? Because what you want ultimately at the end of the day is if you have a team that's working on recommendations or A-B testing or the UI or whatever it is, they want to be working on that. They don't want to be working on maintaining the, the rest of the, the, the how of running a microservices themselves. So extract that away so they can focus on their business logic. And if you have engineers that are passionate about that in those teams, then those are great engineers you should add to that centralized org to help you to define and develop and support and maintain these components. Second part is, you know, moving to a PaaS model, right? So you have all of these great components now that you've consolidated, you know, come up with a, a platform that you, where you've strung all of this together and created a, a solid platform that I can just inject my business logic into. So I don't have to worry about setting all of this up again every single time I need to come up with a microservice. And the last thing is around automation. Um, you can't really have a well-defined PaaS model um, for folks to write software on if you don't have automation around the development, the deployment, the testing strategies, the way that you operate all of that stuff. So make sure you have great automation. And if you have great automation and, and, um, and a way to write 
right, platform as a service, you know, we found that that will really increase your velocity. A good example of this is, you know, we're doing some testing right now um, on a service that used to run um, on the sort of old legacy stuff, and then we they would be able to push maybe at best a couple of times a week, right? And the developers that's working on the new PaaS model um, with all the tooling that we provided can now push multiple times a day very, very seamlessly, and they have really good um, sort of um, confidence that the code that they're pushing is going to be reliable because all the components are having abstracted away. There's this good, there's good testing frameworks and pipelines that's already been pre-set up for the, um, by the, all the tooling that we've invested. So uh, thanks so much for having me. Um, if you're interested in any of this, this stuff, come up and chat. I'm happy to chat about you know, other, other strategies that folks have. And uh, thank you very much. Thanks, you know, that was great. So one of the great things you know about Netflix is they open source loads of stuff. I, I'm really looking forward to seeing new uh, arrive as an open source project. I did try out the URL. No, it does not work. <laughs> um, you get the Netflix homepage. Um, I, I, I thought it was interesting that uh, you know mentioned about uh, removing people from the process. We've all, or you should have read the, uh, the analysis of the recent AWS outage, which was literally uh, some operator guy typing the wrong number into a command line and shutting down most of uh, AWS instead of a part of AWS. Getting people out of your systems is a really good idea. 